Hello, my name's Simon Woodman and I'm the Minister of Bloomsbury Central Baptist Church in London. In this session, I'm going to be uh, talking about the book of Revelation. It's a talk entitled, It's the End of the World as We Know It, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About the Book of Revelation. In the interests of disclosure, the material was originally prepared for the Bible Society as uh, part of a publication they put together with a fresh translation of the Book of Revelation. There have always been people who have sought to predict the date of the end of the world, from the prophecies of Nostradamus to the date setting of American doomsday prophet Harold Camping, from 17th century millennialists to the 10th century monk Joachim of Fiore, from the messianic prophets of first century Judaism to the more recent end of the Mayan calendar in 2012. There has never been a shortage of people predicting the end of the world. And yet here we still are, and the world is still turning. In the 20th century, end of the world prophecies took a technological turn, and many who grew up in the shadow of the Cold War genuinely feared that the world might imminently end in nuclear holocaust. In the 1970s, it was believed that the world was cooling and that a new ice age was coming, as the punk rock group The Clash famously sang in their song, London Calling. The current and genuine fears about global warming and climate change inspire similar levels of fear, anxiety, denial or activism. And yet, for now, here we still are. So far, no one has set a date which has been proved right, which ties in, of course, with something Jesus said. Not even I know the date and time my father has set. That's from Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. So what of the end times? Many of those who have set dates, made films or written books about the end of the world have claimed inspiration from the book of Revelation. In fact, if you ask most people what they know about Revelation, one of the things they will say is that it's about the end of the world. And it's true, there is a lot of imagery in Revelation that sounds pretty catastrophic. Apocalyptic, you might say, but we'll come to that shortly. However, is it actually accurate to say that Revelation is about the end of the world? Well, yes and no. If what we mean is, is the book of Revelation a kind of dummy's guide to the end of the world, then no, it isn't. And those who have tried to make it such can show us that Revelation is no better at helping us predict the end of the world by date than, say, Nostradamus. However, there may be another way Revelation can indeed speak to us very powerfully about the end of the world. Have you ever heard someone say, perhaps after a tragic bereavement or a serious illness, it was the end of the world? They clearly don't mean that the world has literally just ended, and to assume that they did would be to miss their point. What they mean is that the world as they knew it has gone, and they are now living in a new world, a world that is in a very real sense different to the world they lived in before. Of course, such world-ending or world-transforming events aren't always tragic or traumatic, Sometimes it can be a positive thing that ends one world and starts another. Think of the unexpected lottery win, or falling in love, or becoming a parent. The old world ends, and a new world begins. So when the book of Revelation uses imagery and language about the end of the world, it's telling its readers that if they understand its message, if they spend time with its prophetic images, they too will experience the end of the world, as their old world is brought to an end and they find themselves entering a new world in which Jesus Christ is at the centre of creation, drawing all things and all people to himself. Those who have sought to confine Revelation to the realm of predictive prophecy make it of greatest relevance to those who find themselves living in the last days of planet Earth. The difficulty with this is that they run the risk of alienating the book from the vast swathe of humanity, probably including ourselves, unless we really are the last generation, who have been born, lived and died within the normal course of history. Christians usually assert that the Bible is of equal relevance to all, whether you live and die in the 1st, 11th or 21st centuries. 
So if the book of Revelation is to be of relevance to all generations, not just the last generation, and if it proclaims a message of world-ending significance rather than simply predicting the end of the world, what is it that is so special about the message of Revelation? So now I'd like to turn to the topic of audience. A good place to start finding an answer to this question is to consider what significance and effect the book had on those for whom it was initially written. We're fortunate with Revelation because, unlike some other biblical books, we have a very clear understanding of the first recipients. This is because Revelation is a circular letter, written to be sent round seven churches in seven cities in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And although the whole text is intended for each church, it begins with some short letters addressed to the seven churches individually. This is chapters 2 to 3. These tell us that those who first read Revelation were a mixed group of Jews and Gentiles living in fairly wealthy and cosmopolitan cities, fully integrated into the politics, economics and religions of the Roman Empire of the second half of the first century AD. Those in the churches of the seven cities would have encountered the full force of the propaganda of the Roman Empire on a daily basis, with all aspects of culture, from architecture to art, from finance to family life, all reinforcing the mythology of Rome, focusing around emperor worship and the Greco-Roman pantheon of pagan gods. Anyone who wanted to worship Jesus as Lord was immediately putting themselves not only at odds with the dominant practices of society, but at odds with the empire itself, which was a dangerous place to be. Only a few years before Revelation was written, the emperor Nero had systematically persecuted anyone who would not worship him, and had enacted a range of horrific punishments on those who refused to comply. The author of Revelation is desperately concerned that those in the churches he is writing to do not compromise. But instead of simply writing a note saying, don't worship the emperor, don't give up, don't compromise, he sends them a captivating and riveting vision, which invites them to use their imaginations to see their world differently, to see through the lies and propaganda of the empire, and to live lives of devoted faithfulness to Jesus as Lord of their lives. So now the next section is on the imagery of Revelation. As he writes, the author of Revelation casts his mind back to those times in the past when the people of God had struggled to remain faithful under the pressure to compromise to an oppressive empire. And so he uses imagery from the Israelite enslavement in Egypt, painting pictures of sequences of plagues which echo the plagues that preceded Israel's release from Egyptian slavery. He also borrows imagery from the stories of the Israelite exile in Babylon, referencing the visions from the book of Daniel, which speak of resistance to the empire and unswerving faithfulness to God. Throughout Revelation, Rome is consistently referred to as Babylon, as the first century Roman Empire is spoken of in terms of the ancient Babylonian Empire. The invitation here is for readers in any century to identify the empires of their own day with the notorious hostile empires of the past. The author borrows more than just language from the book of Daniel. He also borrows the style of writing which has become known as apocalyptic. This was a genre greatly enjoyed by the Jews in the couple of hundred years before Revelation was written, and which functioned for them in a way not dissimilar to how science fiction functions for us today. If we were to watch an episode of Star Trek or a futuristic sci-fi film, we would know that what we were watching wasn't a detailed prediction of what the future would be like, nor would we sit around trying to work out at what date it would all come true. As I sit here recording this in 2020, the year 2001 is firmly in the past, a date immortalised in the influential sci-fi novel of that name by Arthur C. Clarke and popularised by the Stanley Kubrick film. The fact that the events described in the novel and depicted in the film didn't happen in 2001 in no way robs them of their power because they were never written as 
futuristic predictions in the first place. Sci-fi, at its best, is a literary genre that's set in an imaginary future. In order to free people's minds from the trammels of their present lived reality and to create the imaginative space to reflect on issues which are of relevance to the real world of the here and now. This was how apocalyptic functioned in the first century. It used futuristic, out of this world images and stories to help those reading it to gain a new perspective on their lives. It frequently used the literary device of a vision or dream to provide a context for the vivid images which depicted alternative ways of understanding the world. So, a wicked empire might become a fantastical many-headed beast or a corrupt prostitute, while struggling churches might become shining stars or a faithful woman. The word apocalyptic simply means revealed, hence revelation. And it refers to the fact that this kind of literature is primarily about the revelation of heavenly mysteries, passing on to its readers heaven's perspective on the earthly situation. So the book of Revelation begins with a vision of heaven. As the author, John, writes that he is caught up in the spirit and given a revelation from God about the way the world really is. John's revelation can be summed up fairly easily. The emperor is not all-powerful, no matter how powerful he appears to be. The empire is not all good, no matter how effective its propaganda. Only God is all-powerful and all-good, and God is to be known through his son Jesus Christ, who is drawing the world to himself and will accompany all those who make the journey from enslavement under the empire to new life in Christ. One can imagine John, the Christian pastor responsible for the seven churches of Asia Minor, imprisoned on the prison island of Patmos, praying for those in his churches and meditating on his Jewish scriptures, especially the books of Exodus, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Daniel, each of which reflects on what it means to be faithful to God when the pressure is on to compromise to the forces of empire. And as he brings his world before his scriptures, he has a moment of divine revelation that the world is not as the world wants to be seen, that the empire is really satanic, that the emperor is not divine, and that the churches of Christ are not insignificant, and that despite appearances to the contrary, all is not lost. He then picks up his pen and starts writing his book, borrowing language, imagery and theology from the Jewish scriptures and beyond, but giving it all his own distinctive twist to make it relevant for his first century context. When we come to read Revelation today, we may find it helpful to do with John's text what he did with his own scriptures, that is, to bring our own world to the world of the text, submitting our lives to its imaginative and transformatory effects, learning to see the world the way John saw it, and in so doing, gaining heaven's perspective on our own earthly situations. So how do we read Revelation? Well, we wouldn't read Paul's letters as if they were written for us today. Instead, if we are responsible readers, we read them in their original context of Corinth or Philippi or wherever. We might then, if we want to, begin to look for those places where the world of the original recipients touches our own world. And through these points of correspondence, we may allow the ancient text to speak to our contemporary situation. If we take this same approach with Revelation, we might usefully ask ourselves where the Empire or Babylon are to be found in our contemporary world. And we might ask where the propaganda of Empire is most effective at seducing us into compromise. And we might ask where the suffering church is struggling to bear faithful witness to their faith in the face of seemingly overwhelming opposition. In places like these, and many more, the vision of Revelation echoes down the centuries with a message as fresh 
and challenging as the day it was written. So what about authorship? There are many mysteries associated with the book of Revelation, not least who wrote it and when. The text itself gives us a name, saying that it is a revelation given to John. But the problem is that we don't know which John this is. Traditionally, it was believed to have been John, the brother of James and disciple of Jesus, who was also believed to have written John's Gospel and the three letters of John. However, scholars now think it very unlikely that John the Apostle, who we meet in Matthew, Mark and Luke's Gospels, wrote the fourth gospel or the letters, and even less likely that he wrote the book of Revelation. The most that can be said with any certainty was that the author self-identifies as a man called John, who was a Jewish convert to Christianity and had pastoral responsibility for seven churches in Asia Minor. There's a similar uncertainty about the date it was written, with the traditional date of 95 AD, during the reign of Domitian, giving way to other possibilities, such as 71 AD, during the reign of Vespasian. The earlier date puts the writing of Revelation much closer to the tyrannical deeds of Nero, who was emperor from 54 to 68, and he crops up in the book, but not by name, as a personification of the satanic forces of evil. You see, it's likely that Nero is the solution to another of the mysteries in the book, the enigma of the number 666. The Jews used to take names and substitute letters for numbers, and then add these together to arrive at the number of a name. They called this process numerology, and believed that you could tell something important about a person by the number of their name. So, when Revelation says that the number of the name of the beast is 666, as it does in chapter 13, verse 18, it seems likely that the author has an individual in mind. If you take the Greek for Nero Caesar, transliterate it into Hebrew, and then turn it into a number, you get, you've guessed it, 666. Interestingly, 666 is also the number you get from the Greek word for beast, reinforcing the point that the number of the beast is indeed the name of Nero. Another significance of 666 may well lie in the fact that 7 was the Jewish number of perfection. So if the number of the name of the beast is three consecutive instances of the number 6, the point is made that the beast is forever falling short of perfection. Interestingly, some early manuscripts of Revelation have the number of the beast as 616, which is what you get if you calculate the number of Nero Caesar from Latin rather than Greek. One can imagine John as a first century equivalent to a modern fan of the cryptic crossword, working meticulously with letters and numbers to demonstrate his belief that Nero is a manifestation of the satanic beast. It seems that for John, Nero had so personally identified himself with the underlying force of evil in the world that he was worthy of distinct identification. When using this part of Revelation in the contemporary world, we need to be very cautious about identifying any individual as a Nero-like personification of evil. But there may sometimes be those in positions of great power who have so betrayed the trust and have authorised works of such terror that revisiting John's theology of a person being named with the number of the beast may well help us understand that their power is ultimately insignificant compared to the eternal power of Christ. Some have sought to tie in the book of Revelation with the idea of an antichrist figure who is still to come. But actually, Antichrist is not a concept mentioned in Revelation. It comes from the first two letters of John in the New Testament, where it is used to refer to those who willfully oppose the lordship of Christ. Whilst we're on the subject of things that people sometimes think are in Revelation but which actually aren't, it's time to mention the rapture and the tribulation. This is the idea that at some point in the future, not long before the end of the world, all faithful Christians are going to suddenly be snatched from the earth to heaven, 
leaving the rest of humanity to face the horror of the tribulation. A number of recently successful Christian novels have popularised this idea, dramatically describing cars left without drivers, aircraft without pilots, and so on. You may know about this if you've seen the film Left Behind, starring Nicolas Cage. The idea actually originates in the 19th century and is based on a verse in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, where Paul is addressing the pastoral issue of why Christians are still dying if Jesus is supposed to have defeated death. Imagine a king returning to their home city in celebration. The people go out to welcome him and bring him back into the city. The image in 1 Thessalonians is that those who have gone from the earth, those who have died in other words, have merely gone on ahead to welcome their returning King Jesus who is coming to the earth. Those who are left behind on the earth in 1 Thessalonians are the faithful Christians still on the earth awaiting the coming of their king. However, if this verse is taken out of its original context, it can seem as if it is predicting some future rapture, especially if it's combined with the idea of tribulation or punishment for those who are left behind. The passages in Revelation which are used to support this idea are those which speak of humans suffering on the earth for a limited period of time, three and a half years, or 42 months, or 1,260 days, which are three different ways of talking about the same period of time. But actually, the tribulation of Revelation isn't a description of some future punishment to be faced by those who are not Christians. Rather, it is an image for the suffering faced by the faithful church, who are encouraged to overcome through tribulation, and not to give up when the going gets difficult. Another hot topic catchword which people often associate with Revelation is the millennium. It's one of those words which has acquired something of a life of its own, which has taken it far beyond the pages of the book where it started. In contemporary culture, the millennium has come to mean a dawning thousand-year golden age, such as the Age of Aquarius, or even the Third Reich of Nazi Germany. For some Christians, the coming millennium is regarded as the key to understanding the whole book of Revelation, with endless discussions about whether Jesus will return to the earth before, pre, or after, post the millennium. However, within the book of Revelation itself, the thousand years of the millennium has a much more pastoral function. Revelation is written to those who have faced dreadful persecution and who have heard stories or even personally witnessed Christians being executed for their faith. From an earthly perspective, the death of a believer through martyrdom appears to be the ultimate victory for the satanic beast of the empire. However, John wants his readers to realise that when viewed from heaven's perspective, martyrdom is not defeat but victory. And so he describes those who have been martyred for their testimony to Jesus as reigning with Christ for a thousand years. That's in chapter 20, verse 4. And this is an image of great comfort, as it assures those reading it that when seen from above, the martyrdom of the faithful believer is the precise opposite of what it appears to be when seen from below. An emperor might reign for a decade or two, but Christ reigns and all the martyrs with him for a thousand years. One of the aspects of Revelation which causes confusion sometimes is its rather complex literary structure. It doesn't simply progress as a straightforward narrative from beginning to end. Rather, it twists and turns and cycles back on itself and repeats images and themes and generally takes a bit of getting your head around. This is a deliberate literary technique and it can be very effective because it hammers home the basic premise of the book again and again using repetitious imagery whilst still remaining an interesting and engaging read. One of the areas of repetition is in the sequences of seven found throughout the book. 
The number seven had special significance for the Jewish people, reflecting the seven days of creation described at the beginning of Genesis, and it was their number of perfection. Within Revelation, we meet the number seven on numerous occasions, from the seven churches to whom the letter is addressed, who are described as seven stars held in the hand of Jesus, to the seven flaming torches which symbolise the Spirit of God. We meet the number seven most obviously in the sequences of seven seals, seven trumpets and seven bowls, which provide the overall structure for the central part of the book. Shortly after describing his ascent into heaven, John sees a scroll sealed with seven seals, and Jesus, symbolised by a lion, starts to break the seals open. This picture of Jesus as a lion is contrasted with an image of him as a lamb that has been killed. The powerful lion is seen to be the same person as the sacrificial lamb. Just as in C.S. Lewis's Narnia stories, where the fearsome lion Aslan is bound and killed, so the mighty lion of Revelation is revealed to be the crucified Jesus. As each of the seven seals on the scroll is broken by the lion, a new sequence of narrative is triggered, with the final seal introducing a new sequence of seven, this time seven angels blowing seven trumpets. And again, each trumpet is blown, signalling another narrative sequence beginning. The same angels then appear again, this time with seven bowls filled with fiery coals from the altar burning before the throne of God, which they start to pour onto the earth. These sequences of seals, trumpets and bowls are an example of the repetitive nature of Revelation's structure as the events that occur with their opening, blowing and outpouring, are all demonstrations of the idea that God will ultimately bring evil to judgment, and that he is at work rescuing humans from those forces which hold them captive in their minds, souls and bodies. In the background to all this is the image of the exodus of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, and so quite a lot of the images in the central section of Revelation echo the plagues of Egypt which led the people of Israel, finding release from their experience of slavery. The question of why it is that good people face suffering and difficulty is one which Revelation grapples with, and has also been a feature of the way the text has been interpreted down the centuries since it was written. Revelation's answer to this question is most explicit in the story of the two witnesses who symbolise the church. They faithfully bear testimony to the lordship of Jesus and are ultimately killed by those who cannot bear to hear their words. The point here is clear. As Jesus himself met persecution, so those who bear his name can expect nothing less. However, just as death could not hold Jesus in its grasp, neither will death defeat the church. And so the two witnesses are returned to life. The fruit of their faithful testimony is seen to be the fulfilment of the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come on earth as in heaven, as the kingdoms of the earth become the kingdom of God. That's found in chapter 11, verse 15. One of the great enduring images of Revelation is that of the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the picture of four great st stallions galloping across the sky at the end of time is one that many of us know well. However, as is so often the case with Revelation's wonderful images, the things people have done with them don't always do justice to the images themselves. Rather than being something that will happen at some point in the future, it makes more sense to understand the image of the four horsemen as a picture of the way the world was, is, and will be. In John's world of the first century, he saw death, suffering, war, economic injustice, plague, and pestilence rampaging through the world, creating nothing less than hell on earth. John's great insight 
is that e these evil forces are set loose in the world wherever humans create and recreate empire, whenever humans construct those satanic, political, economical, ideological and military institutions or empires which take for themselves the power and privilege and devotion that by rights belongs to God alone. Another of Revelation's powerful images for empire that displaces God from the centre of the cosmos is that of the great whore of Babylon. We've already mentioned the image of Babylon being used for Rome. We meet her towards the end of the book in chapter 17, and she is presented as a pastiche of the goddess Roma. The Romans personified their empire as a female goddess. Think of Britannia symbolising the British Empire. And statues and paintings of Roma were common. John reworks this image of the empire as a beautiful, virginal, noble, pure woman and describes her instead as a prostitute, as the great whore. Instead of the Roman Empire being a system of trade which benefits all parties, which is how it presented itself, John paints it as an economic system which corrupts those who buy into its benefits. And it's no accident that the great whore rides the great beast, which symbolises the military power and might of the Roman Empire. It is so often the case that economic corruption and military might go hand in hand, colluding together to take wealth from the earth by both deception and force. It is a legitimate question to ask where in our world can we see the great whore of economic oppression in league with the great beast of military might, seducing and compelling the world into submission. The hopeful promise of Revelation is that such beasts are not eternal and that God is at work to bring all that is evil to its ultimate end and all that is good to its ultimate goal. Revelation ends with a vision of a recreated cosmos, the new heavens and new earth. Those who have journeyed their way through the book who have entered into its vision of heaven and have learned to see the world as heaven sees it, are granted a final vision of the way the world could be and are invited to have faith that this is the way the world will be. At the centre of this vision of the renewal of all things lies an image of the church, depicted as a city and called the New Jerusalem. In the first century, the temple in Jerusalem was the place where the Jews believed God lived, it's likely that the temple had been destroyed by the Romans just a few years before Revelation was written, and so John's description of the church as the New Jerusalem sent a powerful signal that God was no longer to be confined to one earthly city, but was now present wherever people gathered in the name of Jesus. The city of New Jerusalem is offered as an alternative to the city of Babylon or Rome, and the invitation is for those who have seen the evils of Babylon to transfer their citizenship to the New Jerusalem. In today's world of rampant nationalism and divisive tribalism, the challenge to give one's primary allegiance to the heavenly city rather than to any earthly power offers a profound antidote to the evils of ethnic tension and division. Within the scheme of Revelation, the faithful people of God are central to the salvation of creation. Those who follow Christ through suffering are those who share in the great resurrection of all things. But more than this, the churches have a crucial part to play in the recreation of the cosmos as they bear faithful witness to the inbreaking kingdom of God in the midst of their present those who pray and live out your kingdom come on earth as in heaven are those who bring the future into being in the here and now and so give shape to the alternative hopeful future that Revelation proclaims. The good news or gospel of Revelation is that evil cannot last forever and so evil and all its works are seen to be cast into the lake of fire and burned away. Even death and hell are thrown into the lake of fire, as humanity is at the last 
freed from the destructive powers of the Satanic Empire. <laughs>